Get out a pencil and paper. So, Zig Ziglar says you were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. Plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. Zig was born in 1926, and he just passed away last week in 2012. He was actually born Hillary Hinton Ziegler. Hillary Hinton Ziegler was his name. And he was the 10th of 12 children from Yazoo City, Mississippi. Now, usually, don't they tell you that the superstars are the firstborn? Can I tell you that? So all of us that weren't born first, second or third or fourth or fifth, 10th <laughs> out of 12. 10th out of 12. Yazoo City, Mississippi. Now, if you're from Yazoo, anybody here from Yazoo City? <laughs> anybody here from Mississippi? Yes. yes. Really? Other than Kevin. Are you really from Mississippi? Yes. Are you really? Jackson. Jackson, Mississippi. Good for you. Good for you. How, how close to Yazoo? I don't know. Well, it was in the obituary, so I wanted to share it with you. Good job. Zig served briefly in the Navy in World War II and then began as a salesperson for many years out of the Navy. But he wasn't successful, really successful, until he started in his mid-40s. So for some of us, it just takes like the pump. You gotta keep going, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going. But he started to really gain some momentum and success in the mid-40s. And there's some sayings that he had that I had written down that were important to me that I wanted to share with you and maybe we could explain them to you. One of them, not necessarily in any particular order, one of them he said that remember that failure is an event, not a person. Failure is an event, not a person. He said everyone fails one time or another and it can often feel when you're failing and it's not happening for you, like you can't recover from it. This is what Zig is telling us. You know, he says, how many times have you had the wind knocked out of you because of failure, only to discover that a little ways down the road, it wasn't so bad? And he uses the example of Walt Disney. He said, Walt Dis was, the question was, is Walt Disney a failure? not by our standards. Walt was fired by the newspaper editor because he lacked imagination and he had no good ideas. True story, okay? Walt Disney went bankrupt seven, several times and so would you call him a failure for doing that? I mean, people go bankrupt, people have tough times. Certainly Walt Disney did. Walt Disney took his failures and built on them, and now we have, on his back, the largest media conglomerate in the world, based on his visions, his ideas, his failures. The next one I, I wrote down here from Zig is you will get all you want in life if you help another, uh, enough other people get what they want. I talk about that. I've said that once or twice a month for my entire career. In fact, in fact, that's probably what I base my success on, helping others get what they want, helping you get what you want, and others throughout my career get what they want. So then, therefore, I can get what I want. Uh, but I have to give to you first before I get. You know, it's his example of want, having a stove in front of you and saying to the stove, you give me heat and I'll give you wood. How many times have we heard that? How many times have we thought that? You know, boy, if they just give me this listing, you know, I'll work hard. Now, I haven't worked that hard up to this point. And I probably didn't do all the things that I should have done up to this point. 
but if I could get that listing, I'll really, 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 really work hard. And then something happens and you don't get the listing. Or you don't get the job. You don't get the opportunity. So I wrote down here, you get what you, you get, uh, you will all, excuse me, you will get all you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Yet so many people ignore this thought. It all comes down to how you think of things. He says, for the most of us, most of the time, it's all about me, 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 what's in it for me, 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 me. What am I going to get out of this? Me, 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 me. We have to turn that around and write down you, 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 you. What can I help you with? What can I help you with? What can I help you with? How can I help you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? That's where you have to be coming from. Zig says if you take it out of me and you go into you. Take it out of me and go into you. People want to do business with you because you help them get what they want. Think about this for just a second. People want to do business with you because you help them get what they want. They don't do business with you to help you get what you want. Think about that. Do they do business with you because you want to buy a new car? In fact, if they think you have what we call commission breath, they run the other way, don't they? Yes. I need this deal. I gotta have this deal. I need this deal. I gotta have this deal. You don't understand my house payment. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. You might be, by the way, the best person for the deal, but you're coming to it from the wrong place. They reject you. I wrote down here. People. People often say motivation doesn't last. This is one of my favorites. People often say motivation doesn't last. Neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. That's a Zig Ziglarism. People often say motivation doesn't last, and neither does bathing. Bathing, that's why we recommend it daily. My suggestion to you is to take 10 minutes four times a day. 10 minutes, four times a day. Plug in that, listen to that. That was six minutes. Six minutes. You think that could help you if you watch that a couple times a day to remind you of where you are, what's going on? My gosh, you're on the computer anyway. You know, you've got your phone. It's all, it's all hooked up. It's, you've got this great smartphone. You can push the button. And what do you got? You're on Facebook. You're on Facebook talking to your buddies. Or you're looking at your emails, you know, going through there. Why don't you plug in a couple of Zig Ziglarisms a day? Take five or ten minutes. Read it. Learn it. Pour good stuff into your head. Because what happens to us is that we tend to get involved in all this negativism. And our business can be stressful. It can be difficult. And to come out of it 10 minutes, four times a day. Write that down for yourself. Do that this week for yourself. 10 minutes, four times a day. Read something positive. Read something motivational. Watch something from Zig Ziglar. If you spent that time every week just looking at his videos, and reading some of his quotes, that would be your four times a day by itself. We wouldn't have to look any further than things that he's left behind for us. It's amazing. The next one I wrote down here is a goal properly set is halfway reached. A goal properly set is halfway reached. Identifying a goal is vital to achieving it. Yet sometimes we set the bar way too low, and then achieving the goal can be meaningless. Converse to that, we could set the goal way too high. And in a week or two of trying to achieve the goal, 
we start to get frustrated and start to lose our, our desire, our power within us that's driving us. Example. Traditionally, you do 8 to 12 transactions a year and have for years. You go to Mike Ferry last week. You watch the inspiration of Zig Ziglar this morning. You think about what we're talking about here in the meeting. And that's it. I'm going to do 40 deals next year. I don't care. Everybody get out of my way. I'm going to do it. You ever had that moment? <laughs> Absolutely. We've all been there. We've all been there. Now, we know how to do 10 and 12. And maybe we could push it up to 15 to 18. But 36 to 40 is a whole other animal, isn't it? can be done, but sometimes we'll get discouraged on our way to the goal. So if we're not on track to do the three deals and we're only on track to do the one deal a month, then we start to get discouraged and we start to lose the emphasis and the focus. And then we fall off the track. Now, let me share a thought with you. I have to be very careful with you because I make you mad. Because when you come to me with the revelation that you're going to go from 12 transactions to 40, or sometimes 50, or sometimes 100, and I try to hold your feet to the ground and say, let's do 24 first, you get mad at me, don't you? I don't have faith in you. You don't. Trust me. You don't think I can do it. And all I'm trying to do is right here. Trying to help you be realistic with the goal so that you don't frustrate yourself. Does that make sense? So when your coaches, when Bill and Frank and Diane and myself talk to you about that, as we go into the balance of next year, do me a favor. Don't beat us up. <laughs> You're talking 100 and we're talking 50 and you've only done 12. <laughs> OK, we're on your side. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, good. <clears throat> the next one is your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. Who's heard that before? So a few of you have heard it. Your attitude. Not your aptitude will determine your altitude. That is Zig Ziglar 101. So let's break it down. Let's talk about attitude. The manner in which you approach any situation is critical to the results you're going to achieve. He says, if you can maintain a positive attitude, you will always be able to find the upside in almost any situation. Now, there are some people in this room that don't find the upside in any situation. Things are going great, and you're worried they're going to stop. You know what I'm talking about. There are some people like that in life. We have to turn that switch, turn that channel, get focused on what's possible. It's our attitude that helps so much. Your attitude determines your mindset. It's the foundation on which your responses to everything sit. The attitude you choose will determine how effective you are. To maintain a positive attitude, it's important to believe in these things. Write these down. Number one, believe in choice. You must believe in your ability to choose your attitude and your responses in any given situation. Otherwise said, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it. It's not what happens, it's how you're reacting to it. The second one is, when you believe in possibilities, it opens your heart and mind to new worlds. When you believe in possibilities, he says, it opens your heart and mind 
to new worlds, some of which you have only imagined. The mindset significantly impacts your attitude in a positive way because when you're open instead of closed, your experiences are richer and a lot better. Your experiences are richer and a lot better. And the third one is you have to believe in your future. Your attitude will be affected by the hope for the future. If you have hope for the future, that's what's going on in the marketplace today. Up until February and March of this year, there was not a lot of hope. Couldn't see the market. Not only, but most of your clients couldn't see the market, but you started to see it a little bit. The market started moving a little bit. We started doing a few more transactions. Deals started to closing. Lenders started to, the, 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 the problems of each transaction started to go through. I mean, it took us, th think about what I'm going to say. In 2004, maybe my lender friends here can help me. In 2003, 4, 5, and 6, you had to do a fog test to get a loan through, correct? Yes. Does that sound right? Yes. OK. So a lot of people came into the lending business without any skills. All they did was have a lot of mirrors. No, seriously. Think, think about what I'm, no skills to close a deal. No skills to package a transaction. They didn't have those skills. They had sales skills, and they had fog skills, you know, and they had mirror skills. So all these lenders were in the business. And then in 2007, about mid-2007, 2008, all those loans went away, didn't they? Whoa, whoa. 2008? 2007. No more undocumented, is that what they call it? No more stated income, thank you. No more stated income loans, period. Done, over. So we had real estate agents that were only trained on doing stated income transactions. And we had lenders that were only trained on doing stated income transactions. And all of a sudden, the whole market, and there were no, no, zero, not one stated income transaction. I remember it was like each bank was shutting down every month for about three, four months on those loans. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Anything that's in the pipeline by this date will be funded or considered. Everything after that, no way. And it was like in a three month period, we went from here to here. So we had all these lenders that didn't know how to package a loan, create a loan, get to qualify. Yeah, whoa, that's a new concept. <laughs> truly, truly a new concept for realtors and for lenders back in 2007, 2008. So we freaked as real estate agents and the lenders freaked out. And the loans were impossible to go through. Not that they were impossible to go through. No one, or very few, knew how to package them. Very few knew how to package them. Underwriters that were approving loans had been doing stated income loans and didn't have to figure out how to package them. So we went through this whole thing, 8, 9, 10, 11, with the shakeout of the lenders, the changing of the rules, and now you've got lenders that know how to package transactions, and you have real estate agents that understand the concept of what's needed. Well, some of each. <laughs> <laughs> but do you get this? So the market now, and, and our inventory is dropping, our interest rates are low, it's a perfect storm. We have people that can do the transactions if you're out there doing what needs to be done. So there's this hope and this, this dream. I mean, you wake up in the morning in 2008, 2009, 2010, you know, you hoped you were going to have enough money to pay the house payment or try to move money around or whatever. I mean, it was horrible. It was ugly. Ugly. Everybody was spending time just in this, in this mode right here like this. Everybody was hunkering down, hunkering down, hunkering down. Now that's kind of moving out. A lot, actually. The biggest problem right now is there's not enough inventory, right? Say yes. 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 And yet you still work with buyers. Are you guys nuts? <laughs> Are you guys nuts? 
Why would you work with buyers when there's not enough inventory? Logic, just business logic, logic 101. Solve the problem of the marketplace. What's the need? Inventory. inventory. He or she who has the inventory wins, period. End of story. Actually, that's the way it is through this entire business all the time. But right now, it is so in your face, it's like oxygen. It's like so needed, it's like oxygen. And yet, some of you are still showing property to buyers. Mike talked about that. Unless they jump through your hoops, they're completely qualified emotionally and financially and they do everything you say, and they're not looking for a property between, you know, La Jolla and El Monte, okay, then you could probably work with them. And you show them your listings first, and if you don't have any listings, you go after old expires, find those, match those together, put those transactions together. But the market has changed. You have to change. There's a saying, I don't know if I got it from Mike or Zig, or maybe I dreamt this up myself. Because <laughs> it starts to come together, because you read all this stuff. Maxwell, uh, John Maxwell's book, fantastic. If you continue to do what you've always done, you will continue to get what you've always got. Everybody gets that, right? Okay, you have to put a line through that because that's not so anymore. What's so is if you continue to do what you've always done, you won't get as much as you got before because now you have to do more. So you get where I'm going? So if, if you're okay with making 10 or 12 transactions a year, and you do it based on the formula that you've had in the last couple of years that have gotten you 10 or 12 transactions a year, and you continue that formula, you're starting to see you're not doing as much business, right? Yes. Is it starting to fall off a little bit? You know, so you're what? What's going on? You're a little frustrated. You're a little annoyed. You know, well, I'm door knocking. I'm phone canvassing. I'm doing this level, but you didn't move it to this level. You have to move it up. You have to move it up. Continue to do what you've always done. You will get less than you've gotten in the past. That is what the truth is in our business going forward. He said, if you have no hope, then your attitude will be one of pessimism and cynicism. If you truly have hope for a future, a better tomorrow, your attitude will reflect it, and so will your choices. The next thought is aptitude. Attitude? Aptitude. Your aptitude determines how well you do something. It's the level of your abilities that will sustain you and sustain the fire of your attitude. Okay? If you do not seek to improve, this is Zig Ziglar's words, not my words. Okay? So this is not me saying it. That was that guy saying it. All right? Because when I say it, you don't listen. <laughs> so pretend it's Mike Ferry or Zig Ziglar or John Maxwell, all right? I get it. It's, I've spent 40 years living with this. I go see a shrink all the time. And, you know, how come people don't listen to me? And I feel bad. <laughs> if you don't seek to improve your skills or use your gifts, then you will continue to struggle. The more you struggle, the harder it will become to maintain a positive attitude. If you don't seek to improve your skills or use your gifts, then you will continue to struggle. The more you struggle, the harder it will become to maintain a positive attitude. So if you're not learning, if you're not working on your skills, if you're not previewing property, if you're not working on your pre-listing package and making it better, if you're not working on yourself, then you're falling backwards is what this says and it then will affect your attitude. If you don't like yourself, how's your attitude coming out? 
comes out poor, doesn't it? Your weight, your education, your sleep. You don't like yourself because you drank the night before, or you overate the night before, or you stayed up late the night before, or you didn't get up and work out this morning. You don't like yourself. That is projected in your attitude poorly. High aptitude requires two things, he says. Keen awareness. The more you are aware, the better the choices you make, and the more effective you will be. Awareness. What's for sale? Loan programs. How to communicate with people. Scripts and dialogues. What to say. How to say it. It's easy to become aware of your strengths. He says, however, becoming aware of your shortcomings is more difficult because we don't want to see ourselves in that light. We only want to see ourselves here so we don't see our shortcomings. Take a look. Analyze it. Where could I work on? What could I work on? You know, remember, what's the goal? The goal for our weight that we said from the 31st of October was that simply by January 1st, we just wouldn't gain any weight. We don't have to lose it, just don't gain it. And in this environment, with all the turkey, with all the dressing, with all the candy, with all the desserts, with all the eggnog, with all the drinks, if you come out on January 1st with the same weight you went in on October 31st, you win. That makes sense? And he says, practice. So we have keen awareness, and the other one is practice. It, practice, he says, truly does make perfect, but it has to be perfect practice. Don't practice junk. Don't practice lackadaisical. Don't mail it in. Practice at a high level. Now, I didn't say this. This was Zig Ziglar, OK? <laughs> The more you do something, the better you become at it. The more success you achieve. High aptitude be comes from doing and acting on things you learn. Acting on things that you've learned. And then the third one is altitude. Your altitude is about the heights to which you can grow. We all have potential to reach tremendous heights. Just you know, do me a favor. Write that down. I have more potential in me. I have more potential in me. I have it. You have it. That's one of my biggest frustrations, is that I think you're capable of far more than you think you're capable of. And then you, you, you cut corners. You know, I don't need to know all the scripts. How about if I just know some of the scripts? I don't have to have the best presentation. I just have to be an OK presentation. But if I get in front of people, people love me. I'm good. You know, maybe you're not so good if you're, you find somebody that's been practicing. You know what I say? Somewhere, someplace, someone is practicing. And when you meet them, they will beat you. Be careful out there. The market's getting better. So are the agents. They're getting better. They're getting stronger. They're getting it. The group that was at the Mike Ferry event, that 500 people, was probably the best talent that we have seen as coaches in a long time in one room. I, mean, I think you guys are terrific. But let me tell you something. There were some people in that room that are going to kick tush. Okay, So if you're not practicing, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you hope they stay over there. Because <laughs> if they come over here, you...